there might be a lot of people who are really relying on their gardens to produce their food for this coming year. And they need to really keep a close eye on the garden and make sure this, they don't have any trouble. Um, I do have a preference for organic gardening, but if it was my choice between losing all my food or using a commercial spray, yeah. I would do it. I mean, because we're not talking genetic modified at this point. We're no. talking about using, you know, typical commercial sprays that have been yeah. used for, you know, how many years? My, my thinking along that lines is that if I lose all my garden, I still have to buy my food. I don't know what's been sprayed on the ones that I buy in the supermarket, right? But if I have to spray my own, at least I know what's been on it and how much and when. So I can control, I don't have to overspray, and I don't do it unless I absolutely have to. And to me that means when it comes to the point where I'm going to lose the crop and be forced to buying it. Um, otherwise, you know, I keep hand picking, I keep, you know, doing my work by hand or whatnot. That's right. Well, like but I say, we try to be organic as much as possible. Um, we're not uh, what you might call, you know, religiously organic. Uh, and I appreciate people that are, like, don't get me wrong, I think that's a good thing. Oh, sure. But uh, in our particular case, you know, practicality is generally going to overrule in that, in that particular case. Now, having said that, you know, there are certain things you just want to draw the line to. Like, genetic modified, to me, that's not even food, you know, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to eat something that has pig genes in it to make, you know, or fish genes to make ice cream so it doesn't freeze. Like, it's crazy, some of the stuff they've come up with. Right. Uh, you know, using... Uh, a spray, a spray on something that's still a regular yeah. plant, like it's it's not genetically modified. To me, that's a little different, you know. Like, uh, well, there are organic uh, sprays. Like neem oil comes from a tree, and uh, it's a it's a pretty safe uh, pesticide and fungicide. Um, uh, BTK, I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's a natural bacteria in the soil. Um, that you can spray on. Get a footage of that one. Yeah. So, um, we're just going on this back road. Amish uh, Sambo. Never been on this road actually before. It is a nice little uh, produce farm back there. With yeah, I saw Amish that. Amish family working together. Sorry, continue there. That's okay. I can't remember what I was saying. So anyways, um, once again, the people that informed us, I'm sorry, I can't remember particularly who it was because my wife is the one that passed it on to me. Thank you very much. Um, Anybody else who cares to share on this, or anybody that has any past experiences concerning this, uh, share as much as you want, that'd be great. Um, once again, this also is a natural reason to lead to more inflation, as we just did a video on inflation there, on some of the food products. Oh, I will add this little note too, um, a couple of comments I received, and, and they're both right. Had I thought of it at the time, I would have said this. Um, it's true that they've always done things like this with our container sizing and whatnot, that's true. Although I've never seen it quite that drastic. Um, you know, usually they'll do a little bit at a time to not make it as noticeable. But, uh, and also it is true that, um, like I did say, it's not a conspiracy amongst the grocery companies to get, you know, more money. It's, things are passed down. And I think I did point that out, you know, look at the industry to see why, you know, that's true. Somebody had wrote in a comment, they're in the food industry and, um, that, you know, sometimes people forget they have to make a profit, they can't, you know, they're not charity, they can't give it. Absolutely. Uh, I've been in the food industry myself, actually, you know, for a number of years. Um, but it, again, it is a sign of um, inflation, and I think the biggest thing is to look at where these, uh, where it's coming from in the industry to get an idea of what type of inflation. There's different types of inflation and different reasons for it. And because uh, each type of inflation will, you know, how they're handled, can uh, have drastic consequences. Uh, in this case, with a potato blight, I mean, if there's no potatoes to go around, it, it doesn't matter how you package them. It, you know, there's a shortage. I don't know. We don't know yet, really, how what the situation, how bad that'll be. Uh, but it, it can be serious. Uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. Well, it's like with the the damage the the wheat and grain crops around the world a few years ago caused with all the the wheat prices and the flour going through the roof and the rice and everything. Yeah. Um, tomato and potato products are very much a staple in a lot of places. Uh, the majority of meals in North America are served with some form of tomato or potato almost every day. Sure, ketchup. You know. Yeah. Uh, and again, you look at the fast food chains. Uh, sort of interrupt, but if you think about it. 
let's say this affects tomato products as well, which it probably will if it's nightshade related. It, it does. That's the main one right now. Okay, so look at it this way. You, you've got uh, a multi-million dollar company like McDonald's, Burger King, um, you know, numerous chains, A&W, whatever, right? There's hundreds of, you know, lots of these multi-million dollar chains out there that, like my wife has said, they are under contract. Uh, Heinz Ketchup, you know, multi-million dollar corporation. And uh, these people are all bidding on this product. They're actually bidding against you, really, in a way, when you go to buy a bag for your family, you know, 50 pound bag of potatoes or, uh, you know, a basket full of tomatoes or whatever. But, uh, sorry, some guy driving behind me, he just stopped to open his door right in the middle of the road. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, um, you know, again, it's not, it's not like a great big wow conspiracy. But just no, but just look at the practical side of it. It's true. You are going to be bidding against these kind of people. When there's plentiful stuff, nobody really notices it. But uh, as the uh, supply gets shortened, you will start seeing that. Um, just like it is amongst the world, you know, when it comes to oil. As the price goes up, you're, you know, poorer countries are competing against the wealthier countries for it. So it'll be likewise within this own country. Um, I did want to add this too with this video. As someone that's been in agriculture or is, um, diversification has always been um, a good thing. Um, a lot of people today and how farms are working um, work on the economics of supply and demand, of course. And uh, you know, there's four or five main crops that people will farm, and um, they'll they'll specialize, you know, in one crop and they'll grow thousands of acres of it. Now that works well as long as everything's fine and dandy and sustainable. Um, however, you can get bust pretty quick you know, in the case of something like this. Um, in our particular garden, as far as anything that we grow in ample supply, like with the space that we have to sell, you know, obviously our potatoes is our main thing, and um, we've grown uh, ample tomatoes. Of course, these two things are subject to this blight. We'll figure that, right? But, uh, you know, we have other crops that we plant, but they're more just for us. We don't have the space. Like, we've got, well, zucchinis and pumpkins. We plan on selling some of them. Yeah. We've got our own onions. You know, that's more or less for us. As long as the cucumber beetle share. Yeah, and the celery. And, uh, oh, well, we got all kinds of things, I guess. Our beans, our peas, you know. Yeah. Uh, garlic, you know, that's, that's fine. Now, if I had a market garden, a uh, sizable acreage, that's probably along the lines, to a certain degree, what I would do. You do have to sell proportionate to market conditions, and all I mean by that is, um, like sweet corn is, is a big seller, you know, on the side of the road or a market stand. Um, garlic, you know, I would see garlic as a little bit of, of retail and more or less a wholesale item. You know, you're not going to have a great big stand and sell 300 pounds of garlic every weekend when everyone's going up to the cottage, right? <laughs> I wouldn't think so, but sweet corn. But it is good to diversify and it's good to keep that practice in times of this. Um, one of the problems with the uh, potato famine in Ireland, and we did watch a documentary about this, was um, they had narrowed it down to what was it, maybe two or three varieties in general, basically, that they were growing because they, um, you know, they were they were a good yielding crop, so they went with that. As it turns out, you know, that they weren't resistant. There are some potato varieties that were actually resistant to this plant. So we grow, when we have three, to, no, we have four now, four different types of potatoes, but not necessarily varieties. We have whites, reds, the purples, and the other reds. But it would be better to uh, look into getting different varieties and try that out too, and especially with other things like corn and that too. I guess what I'm concerned with, I'll just add this before I, with the genetic modified uh, stuff that they're doing, it, if there ever becomes something, you know, that, that is subject to, it, it could wipe out everything, really. You know, there won't be any resistance there. So, anyways, in the meantime, we'll, um, we'll keep you updated as we learn ourselves what's going on with this. And uh, thank you very much for all your views.